Good evening and welcome. I'm Diana Gerald and I'm Chief Executive of Book Trust and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight for what I know is going to be a wonderful evening. I know you haven't really come here to listen to me, but I really would like to take this opportunity just for a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about Book Trust and why we want to get the nation's children reading more for enjoyment. We're the UK's children's reading charity and we want children to love reading because we know that it can transform lives. How to explain what we do? Well, the easiest way to explain it is to give you examples of what we do. It's a group of mums, carers and grandmothers and their two-year-olds who I met recently at Carl Shulton Library at a Bookstart Rhyme Time session. At the end of the session, they all left with their Rhyme Time books and uh, they took one to take home. And I can still picture seeing one of the mums as I left and she was sitting quietly in the park with her two-year-old son and I could hear her reading the story again and again to her boy. And that's kind of what we're about. Our work is Halima, being supported by our Bookstart Corner program, which is a home visiting program, to support her to read confidently with her extremely lively two-year-old Modu. It's a mum tweeting yesterday as we launch our Time to Read campaign about how she listened to our campaign and she said, I saw your campaign and I read aloud to my eight-year-old again. And it's a postcard we get from some of our children in care. And the most recent one I saw, we sent monthly book packs to 11,000 children in care. And we got a lovely postcard back. And the thing which stuck in my mind was the boy writing, you should really look at page 14 of Claude. It's really funny. So we know that we can make a difference to how children think and look at reading. And we do lots of th different things to inspire a love of reading. Today, up and down the country, health visitors will have been giving new, book, new mothers and sometimes the occasional father a book start pack to get their children and the families on that reading journey. And teachers will be using our resources and our books to inspire a love of reading in their schools and also to engage um, children who are maybe less keen on reading on the reading journey. Over the last year, we've presented the Book Time Lifetime Achievement Award, and we were delighted to give it this year to Judith Carr of Tiger, who came to tea fame, hit the stole pink rabbit, and Mog, who at 93 years old, surprisingly, hadn't won a significant award. We've continued our work with the current Waterstones Children's Laureate, the wonderful Chris Riddell, and we've also launched our Bath Book Bed campaign, fronted by mega nanny Joe Frost, who you don't argue with about anything, including reading and putting your child to bed. And last week, of course, we launched our campaign, Time to Read. Time to Read is all about getting reading enjoyment on the agenda. We want families to keep reading with their children, even when those children can officially read. And we want schools to prioritise reading enjoyment alongside literacy skills. And we want people like you who are here today, opinion formers and decision makers, as well as parents and teachers, joining the debate about reading for enjoyment. To stimulate that love of reading, we're giving every reception aged child in the country a copy of Faber and Faber's Kitchen Disco by Claire Foges and Al Murphy this year. That's over this term, 700,000 books to 700,000 four and five year olds in every corner of England this term so that every one of those children has a book of their very own to take home and read with their parents and carers and find out just how much fun reading is or in the words of a five year old I know it's my keeping book it's for me so I want to say thank you particularly to Faber and Faber and of course to all the publishers who support us. We can't do our work on our own. We wouldn't exist if it wasn't our funding from the Arts Council, corporate supporters, the Welsh Government and individual donations, which means we can reach two and a half million families every year. We wouldn't be able to give out such amazing books and resources without the support of publishers, authors and illustrators who create such wonderful stories and do so much to help us get to children. And we wouldn't be able to have anywhere near the impact or reach if we don't have huge support from libraries, children's centres, health visitors, teachers and local authorities. Every single local authority across England and Wales supports our programmes to enable us to reach every child and in particular those who need us most. So I would like to thank each and every one of them and many of you who are in our audience tonight for all your help and support. We couldn't do it without you. And if you want to know more, our website is jammed with information. But back to our inaugural lecture, which is an opportunity for us to give the stage to someone who can ignite debate, stir our hearts and make us think. As you can imagine, when we were thinking about this very first lecture, we discussed who should be giving it, and there was one name who sprang to mind, and it was, of course, Michael Mulpergo. 
I know many of you might think Michael needs no introduction, but I'm not one of those people, because besides knowing that Michael is one of the UK's best-known authors and storytellers, it's really not quite enough. He has quite simply inspired generations of readers and continues to inspire to children to love stories every day. And any of you who have contact with children on a daily basis will know how their eyes light up when we talk about his books. He's also Book Trust president and a great supporter to us as a charity and to me personally. He's a former children's laureate, a post I think he basically set up with his friend poet Ted Hughes in 1999. He was awarded an OBE for services to literature in the Queen's Birthday Honours in 2007. And he's written over 130 books with worldwide sales of over 34 million copies. I was going to talk about some of the, book, the awards he and his books have won, but if I do that, you are never going to hear him speak tonight. So just take it from me, there's an awful lot of them. And this year, amongst his many projects, he's been retelling the story of The Wizard of Oz from the point of view of Toto the dog. Uh, his latest book will be published, I think, tomorrow, The Fox and the Ghost King. And many of his books have, of course, been uh, published for the stage and screen as well, so he does lots crossing over in the forms of arts. These include Private Peaceful, I Believe in Unicorns, The Mozart Question, and, of course, the National Theatre's multi-awarded brooding production of War Horse, which has then turned into a Spielberg film. In his somewhat limited spare time, Michael also runs a charity, which he set up with, with his wife, Claire, who also joins us this evening. And Farms for City Children is now celebrating, extraordinarily, its 40th anniversary this year. And with all of this, Michael continues to be an extraordinary advocate of children's reading and travels all over the UK and abroad, talking to children, telling stories, and most importantly, letting children tell their stories too. You'll be delighted to know that after Michael has spoken, he's kindly agreed to answer brief questions, which will be hosted, hosted by Emily Drabble, who's formerly editor of the Children's Gu Guardian Children's Book Site, and now happily is our new head of children's book promotion at Book Trust. But I'm going to stop there, because that's enough of me. Are you sitting comfortably? Then we'll begin. I'm delighted to give you story time with Michael Morpurgo. <laughs> Bertolt Brecht once asked, in the dark times, will there be singing? I'll answer him later. The concern I have about giving this talk, supportive as I am hugely of the aims of this book trust time to read campaign, is that I know and you know that I am talking to the essentially like-minded. We may differ as to how we achieve what we are all hoping for, seeking and working for, a culture in which to love and cherish books is common to everyone, a society in which we all feel that literature is universally valued and respected, belongs to us all, helps us to grow intellectually and emotionally, helps unite us, a society where homes and schools encourage children to grow up listening to and reading stories where local libraries are open and free at the point of delivery. We know, without reminding ourselves endlessly, the obvious and less obvious benefits children can glean from developing a lifelong love of reading, the widening and deepening of knowledge and understanding, the ability to empathize, to explore and discover, to raise awareness, to be comforted, excited, provoked, and challenged, to spur confidence and creativity. Like many wordsmiths and story makers, I speak of all this often, rather too often, I fear, at conferences here and there, at literary festivals, at gatherings of like-minded folk, as I am doing this evening. Our hope, of course, when we do this, is that we provoke debate, and that this debate will help to change attitudes and ultimately contribute to the enriching of children's lives and to the enhancing of life chances through a love of stories. That's my hope. That's why I'm here. I think it's why we are all here. But is this a vain hope? What are we doing this for? What is the point? Who will be listening except ourselves? I, like you, can sing the old song, 
blow the trumpet, bang the drum for the love of enjoyment of books, the importance of literacy for our children. Proclaim it loud. I can bemoan the closing of libraries, the homes where parents don't read to their children, the schools where stories and poems can still so often be used simply as fodder for teaching literacy to the test. I could blame successive governments who have all indulged in short-termism in their education policies to a greater or lesser extent who corral schools and pressure teachers into teaching literacy fearfully, who insist that measurable outcomes and results are the be-all and end-all of the education process, who often make a chore and a trial out of reading books, and who have succeeded so often only in banishing enjoyment. But that would be passing the buck. We live in a democracy, an imperfect democracy certainly, Indeed, books and literature have played a crucial role over the centuries in creating and preserving our democratic system, as well as the freedoms and rights we now so often take for granted, the freedom to speak our mind, to write and read what we will, and our freedom to choose. We choose our governments. We are all of us in some way responsible, both for the successes and failures of our literacy and our society, for they are, as we know, intimately connected. So when it comes to reading and books, if we have failed to engage and enthuse generations of children, especially those millions from less advantaged backgrounds, and most certainly we have failed far too many of them, then for all of us, even here among so many who have striven to create a more literate society, it is mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Indeed, I think it could be said that literacy, or the lack of it, even helps divide us, helps define and separate those who have from those who have not, those who feel they belong, and those who feel they do not, who feel alienated. The truth is that over the years, the centuries, reading and literacy amongst our children in our society has certainly grown, and this should be celebrated. But sadly, it is also true that it has not been all-inclusive, as it should have been. Far from it. That has been the great failure on our part. And it has, I have little doubt, contributed in no small way to the relative social immobility that has blighted our society for so long. But let me focus a while on the progress that has been made, the positive, on what has been achieved by many people here today and others, and not just in our time, but over the centuries before us. We should try to see this progress in some kind of historical perspective, to see where we are, where we have come from, and where we are going, to encourage us, to remind us we are part of a long campaign that has been going on for centuries. This striving for a society which encourages reading and writing, where knowledge and understanding are accepted as important, indeed vital to our well-being, as well as our productivity, as well as our cohesion as a tribe, our sense of belonging, all this striving was not entirely down to King Alfred. But I like to think he helped begin it. I like good King Alfred because I love a good story. I am one of those sleepyheads inclined to let the toast burn at breakfast. So I feel for the man. He was tired, for goodness sakes, busy trying to drive out the dastardly Danes, but not too busy once he had done it to put his mind to the education of his people. He knew education and reading was the way forward. He pointed the way. So thanks for that, good King Alfred. The church then held the baton of education and reading and writing for many centuries. I myself went to a school founded by St. Augustine, so quite old, but then I was at school a long time ago. All right, so there was another agenda here. In reading terms, it is true, there is predominantly only one bestseller out there, the Bible. 
a book, by the way, that is a treasure trove of great stories. But the growth of those early schools and universities slowly, slowly spread the notion through the monks to the people that this world of reading was beneficial both to our prospects in this world and the next, as well as to our spiritual well-being. So thanks for that, Mr. St. Augustine. The notion that words were power, that we could have our say, was out there. There was a growing thirst for law and rights. The written word mattered. Framed laws, framed Magna Carta. And all the while, let us not forget, the old stories were being told, being passed on around the hearth, told and sung and performed in town squares on village greens, ancient stories from earlier times, stories that had their origins from myths and legends of our own, and from far away too, brought to us from distant lands of traders, travelers, and invaders. Even then, we had our stories and our songs. We have always had them renewed and retold for each generation. They helped make us who we have become. Keep us in touch with those with who we have been. Then technology gave us all in this country a huge helping hand, truly a giant leap for mankind, womankind, childkind as well. William Caxton thought up the printing press. Now, Stories and poems and pamphlets could be printed in their dozens and hundreds and thousands. No longer did everything have to be copied out laboriously and often beautifully, exquisitely by monks. No longer could the church hold sway over what we wrote and read. The book genie, the story genie, was well and truly out of the bottle. The book took off, went viral. So thanks for that, Mr. Caxton. What an invention, Mr. Caxton. Still going strong, more needed than ever. The printed word could now be read by anyone who could read. And because of the printing press, more and more people were learning to read. More and more people wanted to read. This reading thing was spreading like wildfire. Knowledge was for everyone. Stories, ideas were for everyone. To feed this yearning for stories, ever more poems and plays were written too and performed. Theatres sprang up. Shakespeare happened. And from where did he source the plots for so many of his plays? From the stories he grew up with, passed on down to him, learnt at school, from books, from history, from ancient times. The book, the play, was new and exciting, but seriously dangerous to those who wished to control the way we thought. This spread of new ideas through reading and performing was challenging and overturning old dried up myths, revolutionizing how we thought, opening up new possibilities, new concepts, raising hope and aspirations. The people were discovering that any emperor's new clothes were somewhat transparent. The world was round. God did not bestow divine right on kings and he would have found it impossible to create the world in seven days. Darwin ensured in a book that other ideas as to how we had evolved as a species seemed to make more sense. The more we read, the more we realized that we had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The right to speak our minds, express our ideas, the right to ask questions, to invent, to strive for greater fairness and equality of opportunity. We realized we needed books to expand our horizons, make sense of this often dark and difficult world, to make sense of ourselves and our lives on this beautiful, tormented and fragile planet. Make no mistake, it was not simply strife and struggle that achieved all this. It was the written word, the printed word, the book, yes, and the courage of women and men who so often risked life and limb to write. Yet, even now, after all this time, there were still millions, millions, mired in poverty, hungry, illiterate, and effectively disenfranchised. Despite the spread of education, despite new libraries being built in towns and cities up and down the country, there were still those children who could not read, who had scarcely ever seen a book, never had one in the house. When it is bread or books, 
you choose bread. Books to buy were expensive. A good education by no means universally available and sometimes too minimal to make much difference to the lives people could lead to their prospects. The elite had to a large extent taken possession of this new world, seeming to want to keep it exclusive, expensive, to manip manipulate it for their own purposes. For so many, the world of knowledge and understanding was still unattainable. But books and education and the ideas they had sown and nurtured would not be denied. In this country in the 1930s, little orange paperback books appeared on our bookstalls with a jovial little penguin dancing on the front covers. They were cheap, six pence a copy. Now books became rampant, so thank you, Mr. Penguin. There were books for everyone, all sorts of books too, crime, mystery, poetry, great classics from all over the world, books you could slip into your pocket, take anywhere, read anywhere. Books were not exclusive anymore. They were children's books, puffins, so thank you, Mr. Puffin. Books were truly on a roll now. There was the BBC now broadcasting into millions of homes, so thank you, Mr. BBC. Books being read out, stories new and old, dramatized. There was poetry too, and even some programs for children. Out of the horrors of war and the burning pyres of books came a peace built on hope and on a determination to extend rights and power to everyone through education, through knowledge and ideas. There were ever more libraries and bookshops, and the 1944 Education Act ensured a better education for all our young. More and more publishers were bringing out children's books, all sorts and kinds, fiction and non-fiction, and ever better quality. And more and more people and children were reading them. More authors were writing them. More illustrators illustrating them. Storytellers telling them booksellers selling them. For children, for all of us, it really was going to be the best of all possible worlds. Now we were, all of us, irrespective of income, geography or background, going to be able to enjoy the benefits of reading and enjoying books, and through books to aspire to follow the pathway to fulfillment. So I was lucky. I grew up in a time of books, being read to, learning to love books, listening to children's radio. But there was no library at St. Matthias, my Church of England LCC school on the Warwick Road in West London. No books for enjoyment, just textbooks, readers. I had loved stories before I went to that school because my mother read to us. Only her favorite stories and poems read them with a passion. We loved them with a passion. They were fun. They were exciting. I longed for our story time with her. Loved books, loved stories. School killed all that. Took the wonder of stories, the music and playfulness of language, and turned it all into a subject to be used for comprehension tests, handwriting tests, grammar tests, parsing, spelling tests, and punctuation tests. In these tests, at least as many of us failed as succeeded. That's the point of tests, to separate those who pass from those who fail. Testing is supposed to encourage both. Well, it doesn't. When you fail, it brings only a sense of worthlessness and hopelessness, I know. It brings fear and shame and anxiety. It separates you from those who have passed, rocks confidence ruins self-esteem. You disappoint yourself, disappoint others. You give up. I gave up. To give up on books is to give up on education. And if you give up on education, then you can so easily give up on hope, give up on your future. This way you can so easily turn children away from books and reading. And that can be a life sentence a life without books. So many avenues are barred, so many possibilities never imagined, so many discoveries never made, so much understanding of yourself, of others, stunted forever. So much creativity shriveled before it ever had the chance 
to take root, grow and flower. But I was lucky. I was granted a second chance. I had a mother who had sowed the seed early on, passed on to me her love of words and stories and poems. I had just enough wonderful teachers in each of my three schools and then at university to begin to restore my confidence. They helped grow the seed which had almost died in me. I was fortunate indeed. I was later to become a teacher myself, and in a sense, I have never in my adult life not been a teacher. Yet, despite my best efforts as a teacher, and the best efforts before me of King Alfred, William Caxton, William Shakespeare, libraries, paperback books, publishers, great writers and illustrators, and thousands upon thousands of talented teachers and devoted parents, there still exists almost an apartheid system of a kind in this country between haves and have-not children, between those who read, who through books, through developing an enjoyment of literature, can have the opportunity to, to access the considerable cultural and material benefits of our society, and those who were made to feel very early on that the whole world of words, of books, of stories, of ideas was not for them, that they were not clever enough to join that world that it was not the world they belonged to, that it was shut off from them forever in the country of Shakespeare, of Wordsworth, of Dickens, of Hughes, and Dahl, and Pullman, and Rowling. The great divide was still there, is still there. Maybe not wider still and wider, but shamefully still there. I may, I hope, have helped some of the children I taught on their way. I may have, through my writing, encouraged some children to become readers for life, but not enough. Not enough. There are far too many children I failed, as a teacher, as a writer, and campaigner too. Our prisons are full of them, full of those we have failed. Many remain lonely and marginalized all their lives. The right book, the right author, the right parent, the right teacher, the right librarian at the right time might have saved some of them at least, made the difference, shone a light into a dark life, turned that life around. So, in spite of all our best intentions, yes, of politicians, writers, illustrators, storytellers, the whole publishing and book-selling world, libraries, theatres, parents, all of us, to reach out and include Millions of our children still feel excluded and alienated. But what are we to do? Where have we gone wrong? Well, it's obvious. It's the story, stupid. We know what works, and it really is simple. Mum and Dad finding the time to tell stories, reading stories they love too, teachers given the time and space, often within school time, to do the same. A good library in every school and in the community, writers and storytellers and illustrators visiting schools, spending time with the children, telling their tales, drawing their pictures, singing their songs, theatres reaching out to family audiences and coming into schools with their productions, as many do, shows being put on at prices families can afford. And so what more can we do? Most certainly, we have to go on singing the song, blowing the trumpet, banging the drum, but not always louder, more tunefully perhaps. Just talking about it, giving lectures about it amongst ourselves certainly doesn't put it right. Here are a few notions that cost very little or nothing. I like notions. Do not ever close libraries, in or out of school, simply make them better. Librarians, teachers, parents need the tools to do the job. Children need the books. They have a right to the books. Read a story to every child at bedtime every night. And let there be half an hour of story time at the end of school in every primary school up and down this country. Choose an author or poet or illustrator the children love. Call that half hour Philip Pullman time.
or Quentin Blake time, David Walliams time, Roald Dahl time, Julia Donaldson time, Anthony Horowitz time, David Armand time, Shirley Hughes time, J.K. Rowling time, Chris Riddell time, Judith Carr time, Michael Rosen time, Michael Foreman time, even Michael Morpingo time if you're desperate. <laughs> Whoever you like, but make this half hour the one they all long for that they do not want to be over. I love children at the end of the day to dread the school bell in the middle of a story. Invite parents and grandparents, people from the local community, from the world community to come in and read them, to tell their own stories, pass them on. Make story time at the end of the day a special time, a fun time, devoted entirely to reading, to writing, to storytelling, to drama. No testing, no comprehension, no analysis, no interrogation. Let the children go home simply dreaming of the story, reliving it, wondering at it, loving it. All that matters at that early age is that they learn to love it, that they want to listen more to stories, read them, tell them, write them, act them out, sing them, dance them. All the rest will come later. The literary side of things, I mean, you really cannot love parsing and punctuation. But it is important that much I acknowledge, but only once the seed is sown. Sow the seed on stony ground. Try to make it grow with no sun and no rain. It won't happen. You cannot force feed children with literacy. Metaphors are better mixed. Encourage and support parents. Unchain the teachers. Take away the fear. Children have to want to learn, so give them the love of story first, the rest will follow. Horse before cart, horse before cart. All of us here live in this world of making books or loving books. All of us need no reminding of the power of books to transform the lives of children, to give rein to their imagination, to expand their knowledge and horizons, to release their own creative energy. We do not need convincing of this but I can, I hope, try to remind us of the power of stories for all of us, child or grown-up, by reading you a story. So, imagine now. Imagine you are in bed. I said imagine you are in bed. Your grandpa is sitting beside you and you are waiting for a story. You know grandpa. He'll even read two stories if you pester him because he can't say no to you. That's what you like about Grandpa. But you really wish he wouldn't grow hair in his ears. He says it's to catch flies. He hasn't got much hair on his head. So how come he grows it in his ears? Anyway, here comes his first story. It's a story about stories, he tells you. What? No wicked witches or wild things, no gruffalos, no tigers coming for tea. No, nope. afraid not. It's about a man called Stefan Zweig, who loved stories, loved listening to them, telling them, and writing them. All right, then. Grandpa. So Grandpa begins. Stefan Zweig is a man who can read people like books and therefore doesn't judge them but understands them, which means that he never wishes to choose between possibilities. A dream. Stefan Zweig is young perhaps 25 years old, soft face, moustache, tiny glasses. He's on board a ship that's supposed to be taking him from Genoa to Naples. He makes friends with one of the humblest waiters by the name of Giovanni. Before they dock, Giovanni comes to him with a letter. Please, would he read it out loud to him? Zweig doesn't understand asks why he doesn't read it himself. He can't. He doesn't know how to read. 
The traveller can't get his mind around this. His world is a world of books. Love, knowledge, thoughts. He has learned it all from books. He had never thought about it before. But in this moment, it dawns on him. A wall separates him from this Giovanni. He doesn't know what he'd be without reading, without books. He can't imagine it. Zweig writes it all down later in a text with the title, The Book as Entrance to the World. And I understand that the gift of the blessing of being able to think in a wide-ranging fashion and amid a multiplicity of connections, that this magnificent ability, the only true way to contemplate the world from a multiplicity of vantage points at once, is only granted to the man who transcends his own experience to absorb from books what they can tell of many lands and peoples and times. I was shattered to realize how narrow a person must find the world if he denies himself books. But moreover, my very thinking about these things, the fact that I could feel as vehemently as I did about what poor Giovanni lacked in heightened pleasure in the world, that gift of being able to be shattered by the chance fate of a stranger, was this not something I owed to my preoccupation with the literary? For when we read, what are we doing if not sharing the inner life of strangers, seeing with their eyes, thinking with their minds? And now, drawing more and more vividly and more and more grateful on this one moment of happy illumination, I remembered the countless blessings I had received from books. I remembered important decisions I drew from books, encounters with long-dead writers that were more important to me than some with friends and women, nights of love spent with books when you blissfully lost sleep in your enjoyment of them, the way you would were you sharing them with another person. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that our spiritual world is made up of millions of atoms of single impressions, whose minimum number stems solely from what we see and what we experience, while everything else, the existentialist interwoven world, we owe to books, to what is read, transmitted, learned. To be honest, you tell him, to be honest, Grandpa, I thought that was a bit boring. <laughs> uh, have, have you got another one? A better one? Matter of fact, I have. It's a, it's a story about stories, Grandpa says. But I just had one of those. I want a unicorn story. I like unicorns. All right. Unicorns it is, he says. It's by a fellow called Mopingo. Never heard of him, you say. Nor me, Grandpa says. But don't be picky. It's about unicorns. And that's what you wanted, right? Grandpa likes his orange juice. I believe in unicorns. My name is Thomas Porridge. I was seven years old when I first met the unicorn lady. I believed in unicorns then. I'm nearly 20 now, and because of her, I still believe in unicorns. My little town, hidden deep in its own valley, was an ordinary place. Pretty enough, but ordinary. I know that now. But when I was seven, it was a place of magic and wonder to me. It was my place, my home. I knew every cobbled alleyway, every lamppost in every street. I fished in the stream below the church, toboggan the slopes in winter, swam in the lake in the summer. On Sundays, my mother and father would take me on walks or on picnics, and I'd roll down the hills over and over and end up lying there on my back, giddy with joy, the world spinning about me. I never did like school, though. It wasn't the school's fault, nor the teacher's. I just wanted to be outside all the time. I always longed to be running free up in the hills. As soon as school was over, 
It was back home for some bread and honey. My father kept his own bees on the hillside. Then off out to play. But one afternoon, my mother had other ideas. She had to do some shopping in town, she said, and wanted me to go with her. I hate shopping, I told her. I know that, dear, she said. That's why I'm taking you to the library. It'll be interesting, something different. You can listen to stories for an hour or so. It'll be good for you. There's a new librarian lady, and she tells stories after school to any children who want to listen. Everyone says she's brilliant, but I don't want to listen, I protested. My mother simply ignored all my pleas, took me firmly by the hand, and led me to the town square. She walked me up the steps into the library. Be good, she said, and she was gone. I could see there was an excited huddle of children gathered in one corner. Some of them were from my school, but they all looked a lot younger than me. Some of them were infants. I certainly did not want to be with them. I was just about to turn and walk away in disgust when I noticed they were all jostling each other as if they were desperate to get a better look at something. Since I couldn't see what it was, I went a little closer. Suddenly they were all sitting down and hushed, and there in the corner I saw a unicorn. He was lying absolutely still, his feet tucked neatly under him. I could see now that he was made of carved wood and painted white, but he was so lifelike that if he got up and trotted off, I wouldn't have been at all surprised. Beside the unicorn, and just as motionless, just as neat, stood a lady with a smiling face, a bright flowery scarf around her shoulders, and when her eyes found mine, her smile beckoned me to join them. Moments later, I found myself sitting on the floor with the others, watching and waiting, when she sat down slowly on the unicorn and folded her hands in her lap. I could feel expectation all around me. The unicorn story, cried the little girl. Tell us the unicorn story, please. She talked so softly that I had to lean forward to hear her, but I wanted to hear her. Everyone did, because every word she spoke to us was meant and felt and sounded true. The story was about how the last two magic unicorns alive on earth had arrived just too late to get on Noah's Ark with all the other animals. So they were left stranded on a mountaintop in the driving rain, watching the ark sail away over the great flood into the distance. The waters rose and rose around them until their hooves were covered, then their legs, then their backs, and so they had to swim. They swam and they swam for hours. For days, for weeks, for years, they swam for so long, they swam so far, that in the end they turned into whales, children. This way they could swim easily. This way they could dive down to the bottom of the sea, but they never lost their magical powers, and they still kept their wonderful horns, which is why there are to this day, children, whales with unicorns' horns. They're called narwhals, and sometimes when they've had enough of the sea and want to see children again, they swim up onto the beaches and find their legs and become unicorns again. Magical unicorns. After she had finished, no one spoke. It was as if we were all waking up from the, some dream we didn't want to leave. There were more stories and poems too. Some she read from books. Some she made up herself or knew by heart. Then a then a hand went up. It was a small boy from my school, Milosh, with a sticky up hair. Can, can, can I tell a story, miss? He asked. So sitting on the unicorn, he told us his story. One after another after that, they wanted their turn on the magical unicorn. I longed to have a go myself, but I didn't dare. I was frightened of making a fool of myself, I think. The hour flew by. What was it like? My mother asked me on the way home. All right, I suppose. I told her, but at school the next day, I told all my friends what it was really like, all about the unicorn lady, everyone called her that, and her amazing stories, and the fantastic magical storytelling power of the unicorn. They came along with me to the library that afternoon, day after day, as word spread, the little group in the corner grew until there was a whole crowd of us. We would rush to the library now to get there first, to find a place close to the unicorn, close to the unicorn lady. Every story she told us held us entranced, she never told us to sit still. She didn't have to. Every day I wanted so much to sit on the unicorn and tell a story, but still I could never quite summon up the courage. One afternoon, 
the unicorn lady took out from her bag a rather old and damaged looking book, all, all charred at the edges. It was, she told us, her very own copy of The Little Match Girl by Hans Christian Andersen. I was sitting that day very close to the unicorn lady's feet, looking up at the book. Well, why has it been burnt? I asked her. This is the most precious book I have, Thomas, she said. I I'll tell you why. When I was very little, I lived in another country. There were wicked people in my town who were frightened of the magic of stories and the power of books. But stories make you think and dream. Books make you want to ask questions, and they didn't want that. I was there with my father, watching them burn a great pile of books, when suddenly my father ran forward and plucked a book out of the fire. The soldiers beat him with sticks, but he held onto the book and wouldn't let go of it. It was this book. It's my favorite book in all the world, Thomas. Would, would you like to come and you sit on the unicorn? You could read it to us. I've never been any good at reading aloud. I would always stutter over my consonants, worry over long words, but now sitting on the magic unicorn, I heard my voice, strong and loud. It was like singing a song. The words danced on the air and everyone listened. That same day, I took home my first book from the library, Aesop's Fables, because the unicorn lady had read them to us and I'd loved them. I read them aloud to my mother that night, the first time I'd ever read to her, and I could see she was amazed. I loved amazing my mother. Then one summer morning early, war came to our valley and shattered our lives. Before that morning, I knew little of war. I knew some of the men had gone to fight, but I wasn't sure what for. I had seen on television tanks shooting at houses and soldiers with guns running through the trees, but my mother always told me it was far away and I wasn't to worry. I remember the moment. I was outside. My mother had sent me out to open up the hens and feed them. And when I looked up and saw a single plane come flying in low over the town, I watched as it circled once and came again. That was when the bombs began to fall, far away at first, then, then closer, closer. We were all running then, running up into the woods. I was too frightened to cry. My father cried. I'd never seen him cry before, but it was from anger as much as fear. Hidden high in the woods, we could see the tanks and the soldiers all over the town, blasting and shooting as they went. A few hours later, after they had gone, we could hardly see the town anymore for the smoke. We waited until we were quite sure they had all gone. And then we ran back home. We were luckier than many. Our house had not been damaged. It was soon obvious that the center of town had been hardest hit. Everyone seemed to be making their way there. I ran on ahead, hoping and praying that the library had not been bombed, that the unicorn lady and the unicorn were safe. As I came into the square, I saw smoke rising from the roof of the library and flames licking out of the upper windows. We all saw the unicorn lady at the same moment. She was coming out of the library, carrying the unicorn, staggering under its weight. I ran up the steps to help her. She smiled me a thanks as I took my share of the weight. Her eyes were red from the smoke. Between us, we set the unicorn down at the foot of the steps, and she sat down, exhausted, racked with a fit of coughing. My mother fetched her a glass of water. It must have helped, because the coughing stopped. And all at once, she was up on her feet again, leaning on my shoulder for support. The, the books, the books, she breathed. When she began to walk up the steps, I followed her without thinking. No, Thomas, she said. You stay here and look after the unicorn. Then she was running up the steps into the library, only to reappear moments later, her arms piled high with books. That was the moment the great book rescue began. People seemed suddenly to surge past me up the steps into the library, my mother and father amongst them. It wasn't long before our whole system was set up. We children made two chains across the square from the library to the cafe opposite, and the books everyone rescued went from hand to hand to hand, ending up in stacks on the floor of the cafe. The fire was burning ever more fiercely, the flames crackling, smoke billowing now from the roof. No fire engines came. We found out later the fire, engine had been, the fire station had been hit. Still the books came out 
Still the fire burned, and more and more people came to help until the cafe was filled with books, and we had to use the grocer shop next door. The moment came when there were suddenly no more books to pass along, and we all wondered why. Then we saw everyone coming out of the library, and last of all, the unicorn lady helped by my father. They came slowly down the steps together, their faces smudged and blackened. The unicorn lady sat down heavily on the unicorn and looked up at the burning building. We children all gathered around her as if waiting for a story. Well, we did it, children, she said. We saved all we could, didn't we? I'm sitting on the unicorn, so any story I tell is true because we believe it can be true. We shall build up our library again, just as it was. Meanwhile, we shall look after the books. Every family can take home all the books they can manage and care for them. And when in one year or two or three we have our new library, then we shall all bring back our books and we shall carry the magic unicorn inside and we shall all tell our stories again. All we have to do, children, is make this story come true. So it happened just as the unicorn lady had said it would. Like so many families in the town, we took home a wheelbarrow full of books and looked after them. Sure enough, the library was rebuilt just the same as the old one, only by now everyone called it the unicorn. And we all brought our books back just as the unicorn lady had told it in her story. The day the library opened, because I had helped carry the unicorn out, I got to carry him back up the steps with the unicorn lady. And the whole town was there, cheering and clapping, the flags flying, the band playing. It was the proudest and happiest day of my life. And now, all these years later, we have peace in our valley. The unicorn lady is still the town librarian, still reading her stories to the children after school. As for me, I'm a writer now, a weaver of tales, and if from time to time I lose the thread of my story, all I have to do is go and sit on the magic unicorn and my story flows again. So believe me, I believe in unicorns. I believe in them. Absolutely. Quite good, Grandpa, you tell him. But it's not so good as Roald Dahl or David Walliams or Michael Rosen or Lauren Childs or Enid Blyton or Horrible Henry or Harry Potter or Hungry Caterpillar. Love you, Grandpa. Good night. And I love you too, says Grandpa. We began with Bertolt Brecht, if you remember, with a question. Let's end with him. In the dark times... There will there be singing, he asked. Yes, Mr. Brecht, I tell him. There will be singing and storytelling and reading too and writing, Mr. Brecht. That's maybe the only way we can come one day out of the darkness and into the light. Okay, Michael, we're all ready for bed now because we've had our good story. I'm just ready to snuggle up. There's something about you that just makes me want to pull my chair up to the fire and just close my eyes and listen. Sounds like a proposal. (laughs) (laughs) And I think it's truly amazing. When I go into schools, um, I always ask children, my first question to any child I ever meet wherever I go is, what do you love to read? Who do you love? And they always tell me, cool, running wild... Private Peace for Warhorse, all kids from all backgrounds, from all different kinds of schools. And I just 
They don't always understand. say this. They always do. How come other authors sell any books I, at all? I don't understand I don't know this. how they do. They might add a few more to the <laughs> list, but they, you're always up there, top of the shop. You're the master storyteller for I'm, a reason. I'm just the oldest. <laughs> <that's> old, <laughs> and you're very old. But, um, but how do you actually do that? I am fascinated to know how you write. Why are your stories kind of perfect for everyone? Um, I don't know if they're perfect, but I, I tell you what I think is... It's not a secret. It's what every writer, I think, tries to do. Uh, you have to write... Finally, you have to write about what you care about and what you mean. You have to look a child in the eye and tell that child the story that means so much to you, otherwise you wouldn't trouble to write it. You have to live the characters yourself. You have to become an actor in the drama that you're imagining as you write. You have to be able to see the landscape around you, I suppose, and live in it. And sometimes plunge yourself back into history. And I don't do much ahead, but I do plunge myself mm. back a bit. I think it's honestly that business of, well, I hope it is, it's about integrity. It's a, not, I'm not saying I am like that, but I think that is the secret of really good writing, is when you feel, I mean, when I read that piece from this wonderful book, Summer Before the Dark, I don't know if some of you heard it on the radio, uh, by Volker Weidemann, um, I just published by the Pushkin Press. Uh, I didn't really say enough about publishers and how wonderful they are, actually, because that, that risk that publishers take with every book they put out there is what makes the whole book world alive. It makes it change all the time. Um, could we give a hand for publishers, please? Thank you. I only said that to increase my, <laughs> my royalty option the next time. <laughs> Yeah, very good point. And we are in a, a real golden age of publishing as well. Well, we're in a we? golden age of writing. Of you writing. Know. Yeah, I think yeah. we are. And I know people say I shouldn't go on saying it, but I do think what's wonderful about today for children, it's good to talk about the positive. The great thing is that there are books out there now, providing children can access them, get at them. There are books for all children, whatever kind and type you might be. And that's what's changed, because when I was young, it was... It was the beginning of things, you know. The, the, the you, books were there. What did you actually love when you were... What were the oh, stories your mum was reading Enid to Blyton you? Enid Blyton I read to myself because it was forbidden. Yeah. You weren't allowed to read Enid Blyton. Were you not? Oh, no, 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 no. I went to a proper school where that was... <laughs> those kind of books were not for it was trash people like them. us. Yes, um, and really, literally read it by torchlight under the oh, wow. blanket, which made it, of course, very exciting. <laughs> what was your favourite? Magic Faraway Tree for me. No, 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 no. It was Five Go to Smuggler's Top. <laughs> um, you, you had to, you had the great thing about Enid Blyton, and it's important, what she did actually was to get children to turn the page, you know, and turning the page is the first thing. If they don't turn the page, they're not enjoying it. And she certainly taught me that, you know, and I think that's really, that's really something we should be very grateful to her for. But those sort of books were denied to me. I was read books by my mother um, that she loved, and I think that's fine. What, Some the classic? Tales Classics, or? they would have been, so yes, she'd have read Christmas, she read me a Christmas Carol and stuff like that, but she was a brilliant actor. She used to be able to do all the parts. And even, you know, with Treasure Island, she could, <laughs> I mean, she could sort of do all that stuff. I mean, she was rather trained. She really was a wonder. She was very beautiful too, and she had a lovely voice. And I just loved the fact that she was there reading to us, making these stories come alive. But she loved poetry particularly. So she would read Wordsworth and she would read Kipling. There wasn't much reading. I mean, they're, they're not true. She did do things like the Jabberwocky, Lewis Carroll, and that sort of thing. But by and large, they were the things she liked. And I think that was fine. She was just passing them on to me. And I have such lovely memories of the stories she loved. One in particular, which inhibited me, actually, as a story maker for most of my life. She read us uh, the Just So stories again and again and again, because we asked for them again and again and again. Why? Because um, the language is so funny to a child, or was then in the 1940s, you know. I loved the way that man played with ridiculous words, you know. The great green greasy Limpopo River, all hung <laughs> about with fever. Just wonderful Just stuff. Just great to read out loud. It was well. wonderful. And the wonderful thing was that my favorite story in the, in the world was The Elephant's Child. And when I started writing, I was determined one day I would write an elephant story. The problem is that all the books I really loved, The Elephant's Child, Treasure Island, I could never get to writing a story about those subjects because they were so good, they inhibited me. I couldn't go there. You know, you just couldn't. And then once suddenly something happens and it releases you and you think, yeah, I can do that. So what was it, the tsunami? Well, I did. No, I did. Uh, the tsunami helped a lot uh, with Running Wild. Um, that's true. And the other one was bizarre. The other one was um, 
something, and this is what happens, I think, with all writers, these wonderful magical moments. Uh, this is quite intimate, so I don't mind talking to you because we're alone. Um, <laughs> we were, my wife and I were um, lying in bed, and lying in bed we like listening to the radio because the radio is like a lullaby. We go to sleep to the world service, you know? And so that generally that's what happens. Anyway, one night we were listening to world service, and I had this amazing dream. It was the dream of a lady who lived in Belfast, it was very specific, and it was during the Second World War, and she worked in the zoo with elephants. And in this dream, the governor, the director of the zoo, called in all the people at the beginning of the war and said, look, we are having to make preparations, I am afraid, to shoot all the large mammals, because if a bombing raid comes from Germany, as we expect, because of the dockyards and things, we can't risk the animals getting into the city, so we are going to have to plan for the shooting of them if this thing happens. And this lady said, no, 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 you can't, you can't, you can't. There's this elephant which she had brought up in a bottle. She said, you absolutely cannot shoot that elephant. He's two years old. He would never hurt a flea. And the director said, look, I'm sorry. Unless you can look after that animal 24 hours a day, um, it's going to have to be shot like all the others. And she said, I can, I will. I'll take the elephant home. And my dream, this lady, at the end of the day, would take the elephant down the street and into the back garden, and that's where the elephant stayed, and in the morning she'd lead it back to the zoo. And I heard this in the dream, and it was just wonderful, and I woke up at about six o'clock, I said, Claire, 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 I just had the most amazing dream, and I told her the story, and she said, wasn't a dream, it was on World Service, the BBC. <laughs> And, and, we, um, and you couldn't believe it, it was so vivid. And so I went down, and, and I, I, I went to, to he who must be obeyed, Mr. Google, and I said, I, and I went on it, and I went blitz, telegraph, elephant, t -t 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 -t. and up came this, a photograph, if you please. Of your dream. At half past six in the morning of my dream of this elephant. So I wrote the story of the elephant in the garden. So I got in the end to write my elephant stories. And then that was made into an amazing play, which it I saw. It was made into a very good play and as well, so yes. many of your books have been made into plays. So your stories, you're spreading your stories to, the, even to people who don't want to read. They, well, I'm, they don't well have to it's read another them. way of telling stories. And that's, I think, in a way we have to get away from. These books are completely wonderful. That's, they are wonderful. However, 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 we know there are some children who have a resistance to, to, to text, you know, for all sorts of reasons. And we need to get them into stories, however, and care, you know. And the lovely thing about theatre is it takes a story and brings it in, in front of the kids, it brings the thing to life. I don't know, did you ever see the play of War Horse at the National? Well, for, for thousands of kids, we once had a lovely thing just a short time ago because we were celebrating the 40th year of Farms for City Children. We gathered together a thousand children from London. Uh, I would imagine 900 of whom had never been to the theatre before. Mm -hmm. And they sat there and they watched this extraordinary play performed in front of them. And I was sitting there, I didn't watch the stage, I was watching them. Mm -hmm. And what was really wonderful, is, I swear to you, they were all like this. All of them just like this, like that. And what was wonderful is that they responded, as they do as we know, to book, instantly. And the actors afterwards loved it, because whatever happened, the children would respond. So if there's a rhetorical question, the children would answer it <laughs> instantly because some of them knew the story. And it just went on like this. And at one particular point, there's a moment where the horse is going to get shot. And it's just, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. And it's just wonderful because they're so in the story. And that's the same thing as when you're in a book. I don't care where it comes from. And the brilliant thing about theatre in this country at the moment, all over the country, actually, it's not just in London, all over, is a theatre for young people, supported, I have to say, really well now by the Arts Council, is getting out there and telling these stories, ancient and modern, so that, so that kids can access stories that way. And I think the theatre has made a massive contribution. I think the National Theatre, in a way, deserves mention because they did something that, in a way, no one dared to do, which was to bring the best of uh, British theatre in terms of design and, and, and music and writing to the unfolding of children's stories onto the stage. They did it with Jamila uh, Gavin's book, Coran Boyd. They did it with Philip Pullman's great classic now, 
And then they, they did it with Warhorse because they couldn't find anything else. But that's, <laughs> what, that's what's really wonderful. They bring the best to it. So when you're sitting there, you are having this extraordinary experience, adult or child. And you know the other brilliant thing is that when children see these plays, they see them with their mums and dads, with their grandmas and grandpas. So the same story is being told to them. And everyone is somehow linked into the story at the same time. That's what theatre does. And that, of course, is what reading does. When a teacher reads... I had a lovely letter once, a really beautiful letter. You don't forget the beautiful letters. Um, beautiful letter from some kid who had written and said, I really love, I like the story, I like the letters that begin with, I really love. <laughs> I really love the butterfly lion. Oh, I love um, the butterfly lion. Yes, okay. I love the butterfly lion, she wrote, <laughs> this girl. I love it so much, but not as much as my teacher. Because when my teacher reads it, she can't finish it. She's in bits. She's in floods of tears. And the other day, she cried, and I got to finish the story. <laughs> but that's wonderful. That's a great teacher. You know, I... losing herself in this particular... And showing to the child, actually, this, this book has got to me. How know? much do you try to make people cry? How important is it, it to It comes to me naturally. Cry. I have probably cried more reading your books. In fact, my daughter always gets really cross with me about it. She's like, stop crying! Yeah, they finish don't. the book. And, um, and I, I, I love to cry. You are the master of tears as well as storytelling. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know what it is. It, it maybe is that was what I was speaking to you before. And I think really good comedy, which is pretty close, as we know, to tragedy. Um, and tragedy, if... If you tell it as you live it, and, and somehow you're with those characters and enduring. Um, I mean, I just had the most marvelous play of a story of mine called The Amazing Story of Adolphus Tips, um, where a little girl of 12 was portrayed by a 35-year-old actress called Katie Owen, a Welsh actress, just the most phenomenal portrayal. And a wonderful, wonderful telling of the tale, some of which, I hope, is in the book. Because what they manage to do is they inject humour into it, but only so that the tragedy is in sharp relief and so that you're, you simply are not coping, either with the laughter or with the tears. And it's so well done because it's so right. No one is pretending. Maybe that's the thing. It's everyone on the stage was not pretending. They were being who they were being. And when you're writing, I think, is what it is. You mustn't pretend. You have to mean it. This is what I said in the first place. I'm repeating myself. That happens when you get to 73. <laughs> um, what impact do you think having that story time at the end of school, which you've proposed, which I think is an excellent idea, um, I, think, or I think secondary schools should do it too, though. Um, yeah. What effect do you think that would actually have on society in general? Well, if, it, if it's the kind of thing that gets going, in the sense that everyone does it, I think something everyone does, providing it, it is done because people love doing it, not because any some idiot suggests it, but because they really get to like it. Um, and they all have something to look forward to. I think l children love it when they do what other children do. I mean, take Harry Potter. One of the great things about Harry Potter is that they could all talk to each other about it. And that sharing of a story is so important amongst them. And if you've got a teacher who loves the story to her and reads it really, really well, and the children love it, and they go away talking about it. It's this business of, it's social media, but it's talking. And <laughs> it's they real just ta media. talk about the thing, like that, and, and it gets, oh, what do you do in story time, you know? And uh, what's your story time called? Oh, we call it Quentin Blake, he's good, he's mm -hmm. really good. So yeah, but Roald Dahl's better. Who did the pictures? Was it Roald Dahl or Quentin Blake? We don't know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and it's that sort of thing. The names are really important of the, of the writers and the illustrators, and they can toss those about. And that's, it makes it interesting. It makes it a subject of talk and discussion amongst them. It, it could become a pattern. I, I really hope it will, because the thing I remember, the best thing I remember about teaching myself, um, I didn't have it at my school, so I can't speak from personal experience, but I can speak from personal experience of doing it. And to reach the end of a school day, we all know, are there any teachers in this audience? Do you put your hands up, please, the teachers? Okay, well, I think I'm not going to raise any eyebrows when I say that by the end of the school day, you really are relatively tired, <laughs> and you're pretty hopeless at teaching a laugh half hour anyway, and I can tell you something else, the children are fed up with learning. 
So you've got this wonderful half hour, when in a way it's almost like sitting on a mum sitting on your bed at night. And that's the time to settle down, calm everything down, and do something like that. It's a relief, it's a joy, it's a comfort that I think teachers could look forward to. But not because someone can judge it. You know, the judging happens 30 years later, 40 years later. Does that person, has that person become a reader? Has reading, has stories, have theater? Has dance become part of their lives? Has this whole world of creativity taken root in some way? And that's not something you can judge to make an education secretary feel happy. But that's education. Now, I know that everyone's going to be chomping at the bit to ask their own questions, so I can't keep you to myself this whole time. I'm going to open up the floor for questions. So who has a question for Michael? Yes, this gentleman here, right at the front. A mic will come to you. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, I'm Dave Monday from the Community Practitioners and Health Visitors Association. Hello. Uh, I am a health visitor as well, uh, and I've got to say one of the best bits of the job was book gifting. I think it was an absolute brilliant part of uh, the work that I did. So thank you, Bob Trust, for all the work that you've done in, in that really important project. It's Health Visitor Week next week. It's uh, what, sorry? Health Visitor Week next week. And I just wondered if you had any words for our Health Visitor members in terms of the important role that they perform and provide. Well, um, so far my experience of Health Visitors uh, in my little village in, in Devon um, has been one of the best experiences I've, I've ever seen of, I suppose, our services that can look after us. There's an old friend of ours who sadly just died only about a couple of weeks ago, who was looked after for 10 years by people coming in, spending time with him. And that time was so valuable. Um, it made his life. They all loved him. Um, he was loved by many women in his last 10 years. And, um, I think that's important that they feel that. Um, and I just, what can I pass through to you? That they're doing one of the most important jobs that there is. Much more important than writing, that's for sure. No, it's a real thing. It's a wonderful way of touching the lives of others. Thanks for your question. Has anyone else got a question for Michael? Don't be shy. Philip, I can't believe you haven't got a question. I do. Go. <laughs> yeah, was he English? Excuse me. Uh, look, what you a Brexit Brexiteer or something? What are we talking about here? <laughs> this boy went to my school. Look at the size of him now. We both went to the same Saint Augustine school. He was there. He knew Saint Augustine. <laughs> I feel it. I can't believe what a shy audience we have here. Well, there's no children, that's the problem. We need to be honest. Here yep. we go. Hello. Um, I work a lot with um, parents um, to encourage children to read. And um, I just wondered, you talked a lot about... Sometimes I find I talk to the same parents who are the ones that are already engaged in reading, which is really magical. And I love telling stories to all ages. But how do you think we can reach the parents who perhaps don't have access and awareness of the importance of reading? Well, it's very hard. That's the breakthrough thing, if you can do it. I certainly have been to schools, for instance, to give, um, as many writers here have been, been in schools after school hours, where the teachers have very clearly gone out and recruited parents, mothers mostly, but some fathers, to come in and be with their children when a writer or a storyteller comes. That's one way of doing it. And to have them there accompanying the children when they go to a theatre or a theatre, that's the only way I can suggest to you. They've got to be made to be part of the scheme, not to feel this is something that is just done at school. That's the best I can offer. That's my only notion. Yes, someone's got a hand up up there, I think. Sorry, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> I just want to say, it's probably not so much a question, but is uh, more a comment to say that um, somehow it's the reading aloud bit that I think, it, and, and the storytelling bit, that it is really important, not the literacy bit. Um, I have only just stopped reading to my son, who is now 29, <laughs> and that's only because he's got a girlfriend. 
<laughs> so he doesn't come home at night and say, Mum, will you read me a story? <laughs> so please, um, could I just give that message out? But I would, would say that you talk about, you know, when, when, when it's a choice between bread and books, we tend to choose bread. But don't forget that, 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 that the books are important. And across the world, at the moment, with this refugee crisis, there are organizations who are giving books. Yep. There's the Library in Lampedusa, the American Reforma, for every trying to reach every refugee child coming up from South America, giving books. There's the Kids Cafe in the, the jungle in Calais. Yep. Books are important. And it's not just the books, it's the telling stories. Don't be afraid to tell a story, right, right. as Michael does. No, 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 that's right. So that's I'm the, sorry, it's not a question. No, no, it's very important, <laughs> because, and that's why I hope, and you heard in my talk, that I use the word storyteller a lot, because it is the telling of stories that is key, I think, absolutely. I, too, went to the, uh, the jungle, and I, funnily enough, I, um, I didn't tell a story, but I sang a song, which is probably why they all wanted to get to England really quick. <laughs> I just want to also show you a copy of Michael's new, new book. Can I show it to them? Yes, I don't know that they'll relish being, having it sold to them. It's £12 something at all good bookshops. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, hi, I'm a teacher um, of four-year-olds who have been in Four-year-olds? Four-year-olds. Bravo! <laughs> How do you do it? Um, it's hard. And, um, <laughs> yeah. We're only in week two. Um, but the one thing that captures all their imagination at the end of the day is reading a story out loud. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter. We, I have some difficult children in my class, but it doesn't matter. The book comes out, they all sit down, they are all quiet, and they all lean in. And I read, not now, Bernard, I must have read it, re read it um, probably about 30 times in the last two weeks, which is a lot. But they, the surprise when I go, rah! It's just like, whoa, and they're there, and it's amazing, and they're like, can we have another one? No, your parents are here. Go home. Please, can we have another one? I'm working in a school in inner city Birmingham where the children don't have books. We gave children a book to take home, and a mother went and bought a bookshelf with very little money to put the one book on because it was the most precious thing her daughter had been given. So yeah. books reach all ages. Yeah all societies, yeah. and it doesn't matter. Yeah. So if you can donate a book, give a book, um, it doesn't matter, because children will love a book as much yeah. as we love reading them. So. Well, I'm happy that Book Trust's um, Kitchen Disco is going to all the four-year-olds. <laughs> <clears throat> That's okay. wonderful. I taught, I taught infants for a term once, um, and it nearly killed me. <laughs> I mean, you, you say they don't that they all listen to a story. I could never get them to listen. He had 30 little monsters sitting there. And, 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 it, and I was exhausted by the end of every single day. And I do remember um, getting books, and I tried, I really tried to get them all settled down. But someone always wanted something wiped. <laughs> what, I don't care what bit it was. Something, something needed wiping. And, and, it, and it broke up any kind of narrative power that there was in the story. And the other thing is that they insist, children that age, on being really intrusive. So you're sitting there, because as you know, they're all around you and you're sitting on the floor to be done with them. I don't know about you, but what they did with me always is I would find this, his fingers creeping up <laughs> my leg. <laughs> Just weird. <laughs> Do you? I want to say the most massive thank you to Michael Morpurgo for this incredible evening of laughter, tears, and joy. <laughs> I've loved it. Thank you so, so much. So thank you for coming. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, thanks to Michael. I knew he would inspire us. He's also challenged us, and he's told us some great stories. We will carry on getting out there, as will all of you, talking about the importance of reading and the love of stories along the way. We will keep on going until every classroom in the country has got that story at the end of the day, because it's really, really important for our children. But I also want to take away, and I hope you will do as well, we sort of need to keep on believing in the unicorns or else nobody's going to come along with us. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.